Now to a different story tonight. It's a bizarre murder case that has gained national attention. A twisted plot line that took investigators years to unravel. A mother went missing about five years ago in Omaha. Her body never found. The woman who killed her then assumed her identity. Today, she learned her fate. Shanna Goliar is sentenced to life in prison plus 18 to 20 years by Judge Timothy Burns for first-degree murder and arson. Judge Burns convicted her with proof beyond a reasonable doubt of stabbing Carrie Farver to death in 2012 outside her boyfriend's Omaha apartment. Goliar previously dated the same man. Goyar not only killed Farver, but for years deceived Carrie's family into thinking she was alive by sending texts. She hadn't been seen since 2012. She also sent thousands of texts and emails to the former boyfriend on behalf of Farver, acting like Carrie was stalking both of them. Goliar wrote a letter to the judge asking him to find it in his heart to give her 30 years so she could get out in 15. Prosecutors say she has no heart and shows zero remorse. From the haunted heartland in Omaha, Nebraska, my name is Brian Corey, and I welcome you one and all to this episode of The Necronomicast. My guest tonight for a late night conversation is best-selling true crime author, Leslie Rule. And I didn't have to look very far to bring you this story. It is the most bizarre love triangle that is too convoluted to believe. It's the story of sex, lies, murder, cyber stalking, and it's all wrapped up and tucked into bed with a missing person case, unlike any you've heard before. And it all takes place right here, down the road, in Omaha, Nebraska. If you saw the recent 2020 special on ABC featuring this case, be prepared to go even deeper with this late night conversation with my guest, author of A Tangled Web, Leslie Rule. And now, calling in on our Newsmaker Hotline, the Necronomicast Hotline. From the Phoenix, Arizona area, we have author Leslie Rule. Leslie, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. I'm so excited to have you on this show. You wrote this book not too long ago. That's going to be the the main part of our discussion tonight, A Tangled Web, which most of it takes place right here in beautiful Omaha, Nebraska. But uh, you have a very, very famous mom, and it took me a little bit to put two and two together. I read your mom's um, famous, most famous book, A Stranger Beside Me, when I was in high school. Uh, We're talking about Anne Rule. Yep. Uh, She had three dozen true crime books. And my mom actually passed away five years ago Hmm. in in her early 80s. Oh, bless her heart. I uh, really enjoyed Stranger Beside Me. It's like the the masterpiece go-to true crime novel. And so your mom knew Ted Bundy. For those out there that aren't familiar with the book, your mom was, he was the stranger right next to her when they worked at the suicide hotline. Well, and what was particularly strange about that whole thing um, was the fact she was a crime writer and she got a contract to write a book about these girls that were disappearing around the Seattle area. Mm -hmm. Um, But there was a stipulation of the book would not be published unless the case was solved. And at that point, she didn't know that her friend was going to turn out to be the killer. And as she always said, it wouldn't have worked in fiction. It was too contrived. But that was real life. Yeah, who would believe that the uh, the guy next to her working the suicide prevention hotline would be the killer? Who would believe that? No, you couldn't <laughs> predict that. <laughs> so you uh, tagged along and you were your mom's research assistant for a long time. And you also uh, took photographs uh, during the trials and for the books and everything too, right? Yeah, I started when I was a teenager. And I'd go with her to trials um, in the beginning in Seattle. And on the breaks, I would uh, photograph the killers. And that was kind of interesting. A little bit intimidating at times. Did they ever look at you and give you the evil eye? Or? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, sometimes they posed. They would, if they saw me with my camera, they'd whip out a comb and fix their hair and then turn and look at me. Um, but sometimes they looked at me like they wanted to kill me. Um, there was one in particular, it was a, um, a female, um, and she was a hitman, Cynthia Marler. Mm. 
and she was beautiful. She looked like a movie star. And she had long, dark hair, cascaded past her shoulders. She was petite, probably five feet tall, slim, um, did not look like a killer. And I went up to her on the break and I said, can I take a photo of you? And she said, yes, but don't take a picture of me when I'm smoking. And she had a cigarette in her hand. And I was so nervous. I started shooting pictures and I took one just as she was exhaling a puff of smoke. And she looked at me like she wanted to kill me. And she said, I told you not to take a picture of me when I was smoking. And at that moment, it, it was like a chill went through me because I was experiencing the evil stare of a killer. Chilling. And she was no longer beautiful and relaxed and innocent looking. She was really scary in that moment. And then, of course, my mom used the, that photo in the book of her with the um, with the smoke around her face, holding the count cigarette, and she looked beautiful in it. But it's funny that um, she didn't care that much about how it might look that she was a killer. She just didn't want anyone to see her smoking. That is chilling. So here we are. Here we are. Years later, and you've written this book. This show is recorded in Omaha, Nebraska. Mm -hmm. Back in 2012, I remember seeing in the news this strange story of a missing lady. And a few years later, uh, some more got added to it where the missing lady uh, turned out to be murdered. And it was very odd living in Omaha and hearing this kind of story. You, you hear these stories happening other places. Uh, you right. don't you don't hear about them here in the heartland. You don't hear about them in Omaha or you don't hear them in Council Bluffs, Iowa, which for our listeners, it's just right over the river, the Missouri River. You don't hear about those things here. It's always more shocking when it hits close to home. Yes. And so I knew about this story as it was unfolding in, in our local press and uh, our local television stations. And how did you hear about it? What What made you dive into this particular story. And we're talking about your book, A Tangled Web. What made you dive into this story? Uh, how did you discover it and and figure out that this would be a, a wonderful, not wonderful, but a sensational book for you to write and to research? Well, I was looking for a case of a female killer uh, because I wanted to warn readers, once again, um, that women can be very, very dangerous. And so I was specifically looking for that. And I started looking at love triangle murders because I figured that um, someone who was killing out of jealousy um, was going to show her true colors the most. That's what brings out the most vicious side of these kinds of females is jealousy. So I was looking for that. And I also wanted something with an interesting twist. And the fact that the killer was a cyber stalker and impersonated her victim online gave it that twist I was looking for. Um, but before I decided on the case, the first thing I did was I contacted um, the victim's mother, Nancy Rainey, and I made sure it was okay with her. And I said, I, I will write this only if you feel it will be healing for you mm. because the last thing I wanted to do was to make someone feel worse. And she wanted me to write it. And so from there, um, I queried my editor. We, was uh, Nancy familiar with, uh, with your mom? No, she never heard of my mom. Hadn't read any of my books. I, I was actually kind of surprised that um, some of the people I contacted who were involved in the story had read um, some of my books and so I always expect people to know who my mom is, but mm -hmm. um, I'm, I don't know why I'm surprised because I have sold a lot of books, but I always am surprised when I meet someone randomly, not at a book signing, and they happen to have read my books. Um, but it can be very helpful because sometimes people feel like they know the author already because they've read their work. I'm equally interested in the story that unfolds in your book, as well as you writing the book and researching the book and, and your experiences. Now you traveled to Omaha and interviewed all the major players and characters in the book, 
of the story. I went three times. I went there three times. Oh, you came to Omaha three times. Yep. What did you, what were your impressions like the first time you stepped off the plane and uh, you started going around and meeting the people and uh, hearing the story uh, face to face? I was really impressed by how kind everybody was. Um, everyone from the detectives to the prosecutors um, to the people who were part of the drama, um, Dave Krupa and Amy Flora, um, they were, everybody was just incredibly kind and impre- incredibly helpful. I'm always amazed when I'm watching these different, I, I did some research, I read your book and then I went back and read the World Herald articles kind of about the case and how it was unfolding. Uh, and I watched a couple of the television specials that have been produced about the case, including the recent 2021 that that you're featured on, and the, and the actual the episode is, is titled after your book. Uh, we're talking about Dave Krupa. He's a young guy, recently single, from his um, longtime um, girlfriend, also the mother of his children, and he decides, you know, I'm a single guy. I'm going to kind of go out, have some fun in my youth. And he meets uh, a, a wonderful young lady by the name of uh, Carrie Farver, and they have a they strike up a relationship, kind of a quick one, you know, um, not too. There, there's not a lot of strings there. And then at the same time, he also meets this lady uh, from the internet, Shanna Liz Goyer. Yes, he actually met. She usually by Liz. He met Liz first hmm. months before he met Carrie. And Liz was the very first woman he met online. And he told her from the beginning, I don't want anything serious. But she latched on to him. And he kept telling her, I'm dating other females. Don't get too attached. This is not permanent. You can, you, we can hang out if you want. But I'm not your boyfriend. Um, it, it did not sink in. Yeah, he made it clear right away that he was, he was a young man trying to find some uh, excitement <laughs> after being in well, this. He, he was, yeah, he was lonely because it was hard for him to go through the breakup and he missed his kids. He still saw them a couple times a week and they stayed with him on the weekends. But after years of being in this relationship, he was suddenly on his own, you know, all by himself in an apartment um, with no furniture. Uh, he let, he let um, Amy and the kids have, most of the stuff. And so he was kind of starting over and he was lonely and he was bored and he looked into the online dating thing. Mm -hmm. There it was. The only thing he had with him really was his laptop. And it just made it easy to start meeting people. Did you meet Dave right away? Was he one of your first contactees? He was one of the first people I talked to. I talked to um, Carrie's mom first. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think I talked to Amy second. And Amy would uh, be his. Uh, Amy the, was the mother of Dave's children, right? And they had broken up, but remained friendly because they were, um, they both were really good parents, and they they wanted the breakup to be um, friendly for the kids, so the kids would feel as loved as possible, and they were working together um, to make the situation the best it could possibly be, but unfortunately. That really pissed off Liz. She did not like the fact that he would uh, drive over to Council Bluffs and pick up his kids from Amy's apartment. She thought he had something going with Amy. And he told Liz, "Um, there's nothing going on between me and Amy. But if there was, it would be none of your business. I've told you that from the beginning. Yeah, Dave was real upfront. He he said he right he right said he was very honest right up front. He's like, This is, you know, I, I enjoy spending time with you, but you know, I'm gonna see other people. And Liz really uh pushed for more commitment. And all the while, I didn't realize this, I, I didn't pick this up from the news stories. And I know when mm, 2020 or or the other show that I saw, they only have an hour to put out all this information and you've written this um, 300 plus page book. And so you can really get into the story and they don't have time on network TV to do this. Yeah. It's really hard to tell for them to tell the story in amount of time. 
They have, but I think they did a great job. Oh yeah, they did a fantastic job, but your book really gets into it. And in, in even in the, the time that we're going to have tonight to talk about it, I don't want people to listen to this episode and be like, oh, well, I know everything. Brian and Leslie talked all about the, the, the case. Oh my gosh, I don't even think we're going to be able to scratch the surface because this is the most uh, convoluted, strange, twisted story that I, I can't still can't believe. I know I said at the beginning of the show, I can't believe this happened in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, yeah. So, so Dave and Amy, they have this kind of nice amicable split. They're going to be together uh, as parents for the children, uh, and, and, but, but no longer dating or being romantically involved. Dave finds, um, you know, this, uh, this Shanna or Liz as she's, uh, it's a middle name, Goyer. And at the same time, he meets this attractive, bubbly, whip smart lady by the name of Carrie Farver, who works uh, doing computer coding for the West Company. And as an aside, I worked for West Telemarketing um, back when I was going through college. So the West name and the West Corporation was very big in Omaha. So she gets a great job. This uh, Carrie Farver gets a great job with West. And she just seems like just a great girl. Everybody likes her. Nobody's had a bad thing to say about her at all. And what's important about that is when Liz meets Carrie, there is daggers coming out of her eyes. Mm -hmm. Like the only person that ever found anything at all wrong with Carrie is Liz. And they had this, this strange chance meeting outside Dave's apartment. Yeah. And I don't know how, how, what, if it was really a chance meeting because um, it was manipulated by Liz. Um, Dave told her he was going on a date. He told Liz he was going on a date and he met um, Carrie and they went to Applebee's and they had drinks and they're having a wonderful time. And all of a sudden his phone starts blowing up and it's Liz trying to get a hold of him and it won't stop. So finally he figures, well, there must be something going on and I better check it out. So he excused himself and he, he called her and said, what's going on? And she said, I need my stuff. Mm. And she was suddenly really worried about a few things that she had left in his apartment that really she didn't care about that had been there for quite a while. And she insisted on coming over right now and getting the stuff and having him go let her in. And he said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm on a date. And uh, he and Carrie finished their dinner and they went back to the apartment to watch TV or play cards or whatever. But the minute they were in the door, they didn't even have a chance to sit down. Then the buzzard outside the apartment was going off. It was a security door. Um, and it was really loud and he couldn't ignore it. And it was Liz refusing to leave. And she's standing there with the tears running down her face. And so finally he goes back and he tells Carrie... I have a situation here. This uh, this woman I was dating is freaking out. And Carrie just shrugged it off and said, oh, yeah, we've all been there. And she got up to leave. And as she was going out and Liz was coming in, um, Liz stared at Carrie, obviously, with daggers. And Carrie just went on. No words were exchanged. Though later, Liz would claim that Carrie called her a bitch, but she didn't. Right. Now this happened in November of 2012. Is that right? That's right. Okay. So Dave kind of in a, in, an embarrassing kind of situation. He's entertaining a young lady over to his place. Uh, another young lady causes a scene, wants her stuff back. All that happens. And then Dave thinks that's all over. You know, he, he's, uh, he works all day at an auto repair place. And so um, Carrie has a house in Macedonia, Iowa, just right over the river again, not, not too far from Council Bluffs. And she's got this job in, uh, in West Omaha. And she's staying at Dave's place. He doesn't think it's a big deal. She's just kind of staying there because the commute is so long. She can shave, you know, an hour off of her day of driving back and forth between Iowa and Nebraska. And they've only known each other for a couple of weeks. So this is a real innocent, kind of a nice, playful, uh, you know, they're courting, just getting to know each other, but she doesn't have a problem staying there. And he doesn't, he's kind of happy-go-lucky as I kind of see from the interviews and from the book. He's just kind of whatever, you know, he kind of goes with the flow, kind of mellow guy. And Yes. And she's staying there only temporarily because she's 
in the middle of a special project at work that demands longer hours. Right. So it's just supposed to be for a few days. Yeah, yeah. She's not moving in or anything like that. You know, he's just kind of offering his place for her to crash while she, you know, works on this giant project. Uh, Dave goes to work one day, says goodbye to her. She's working on her computer at his place. Uh, and then he starts getting strange, unusual text messages. Yes, coming from Carrie's phone. And he assumes it's Carrie. Well, who wouldn't, right? Right. But we all should think about that. Just because you get an email or a text from a known email address or phone number does not mean you're communicating with who you think you are. Hmm. So he thinks Carrie's, uh, she's like, well, we should move in together. And he's like, whoa, whoa, hold your horses. You know, we've already talked about this and, and that's not, that's not going to happen. You know, we're, we, we've kind of talked about this. Well, then Carrie flies off the handle, starts dropping profanity, starts harassing him with emails and texts, and it's just nonstop. And then Liz seems to be getting the brunt of it too from Carrie, or who we think is Carrie. Yes, Liz claims that she's getting harassed too. And Dave assumes it's Carrie because the messages are coming from Carrie's phone. Um, that doesn't last very long, though, because um, the phone eventually disappears. And then they then the messages start coming from a new phone number. Mm -hmm. But the person texting is still claiming to be Carrie. But it doesn't sound anything like Carrie. It's, it's not the Carrie that Dave knew. Um, the, the Carrie that Dave knew was very easygoing, vivacious person. And she had meticulous grammar. And these, and maybe Dave didn't pick up on it, but Carrie's mother did because she was also getting these weird texts, supposedly from her daughter who refused to speak with her on the phone. And Nancy was alarmed by the grammar because she said Carrie would never send a text unless it was perfect. Oh, right. Because like I said earlier, she was whip smart, high IQ. She's got this demanding job with writing intricate code for this company in West Omaha, West, West, uh, West Corporation. And so when these texts are crude, they're vulgar, written horribly, poorly written, poorly edited, if and not even edited, but poorly written. And so Dave thinks I must have dodged a bullet because this, this lady's crazy. This Carrie's crazy. And now she's threatening Liz and, and just the, the sheer volume. I couldn't wrap my head around the sheer volume of communication that Dave, Liz, uh, and everybody was receiving from who they thought was Carrie. I mean, by the end of the trial, this number that was thrown out was like 20,000 texts and emails. Yep. It was a lot. 20,000. <laughs> yeah. How does anyone have time to sleep? I still can't figure it out. And I read your whole book and I watched these shows and read news reports. I still can't figure out how she wrote, Liz wrote 20,000 plus texts and email messages that she sent to Dave, that she sent to Nancy, that she sent to the detectives, that she sent to Max through Facebook, her uh, Carrie's son. She sent, and also to herself. Yes. Unbelievable. Well, she was, um, obviously obsessive and she probably didn't sleep much. Well, she also, we find out later to kind of keep this ruse going that she even sets fire to her own home. She was living in a, a, a section eight Omaha housing authority home, uh, kind of in West Omaha, not too far from where I work. I, I thought that was hmm. pretty crazy. You know, you drop all these Omaha references in the book. And so it, it for an Omaha guy to read this book, I, I, I was really impressed with your, uh, the amount of research and the specificity of, of what you put together for this book. I mean, you're dropping all these, uh, these places that I frequent. I mean, you even wrote about the Pheasant Tavern, which here in Omaha, we call it the Dirty Bird. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, so, yeah. so I have my hats off to you for your research and it must've been through your, uh, uh, your three trips to the Omaha area that you were able to pick up on all the different hot spots in Omaha around here in town. But uh, she sets fire to her home, killing her pets in the house. Um, and yeah. she's blaming all this on this, on this phantom carry that, that 
absolutely nobody recognizes from her texts and everything. This is totally not uh, her behavior or her history in with anybody throughout her entire life. Yes. And it was really frustrating for Carrie's family because um, the first group of detectives who were investigating it, uh, they were really skeptical when Nancy tried to tell them that something had happened to Carrie. Um, they didn't believe it. They thought that Carrie was the stalker. And of course, Liz was trying to make it appear that way. Oh, absolutely. But in all this time, what I thought was was pretty incredible at the same time, and I didn't pick this up from the shows, I picked this up um, from your book, that Liz, as obsessive and crazy and compulsive with her infatuation with, with Dave, she's also stringing these other guys along throughout the entire time. Yeah. Unbelievable. <laughs> and nobody, I know, and I'm not making fun of Dave. He's an Omaha guy. Yeah. And if, and if he's out there and if I ever run into him someplace, God bless you, Dave. But I still have this, I can't believe that nobody for years picked up on this. I mean, this, this poor, poor man and his acquaintances and, and the people that he's uh, like Amy, the, the mother of his children, they are getting bombarded daily with texts and emails every single cotton picking day, there's something coming over their phone that's either a threat, an insult, a vulgarity, many times a day for years. And it took a fresh pair of eyes from these detectives because because people were investigating this as a missing person report uh, from, you know, Carrie was missing. They didn't know where she was. She didn't show up for her dad's funeral. She didn't show up for her son's graduation from high school. And that was totally unlike her. But they were still getting information from her or, or they thought from, from her. So there was a missing person aspect of this case. And then over on the Omaha side, Dave is filling out police reports about vandalism and harassment and stalking about Carrie. So there's like two different investigations going on at the same time across the river about the shenanigans of Liz. Incredible. Yes. And that's one of the reasons I think it was such a challenge for detectives. Um, you can't really blame the first round of police that investigated it because these things were going on in two different states, two different jurisdictions, and they were um, they were getting information from these all these different sources. And it took a while for someone to put the puzzle together. Mm -hmm. And what happened was uh, when detectives Ryan Avis and Jim Doty got on board, they asked for the case. And like you said, they had fresh eyes, um, but right from the beginning, they thought something wasn't right. And they suspected that Carrie was dead. And so they decided to investigate it from um, two perspectives. One of them investigated it as if Carrie were still alive. And the other one investigated it as if she were dead. And they quickly came to the conclusion, she's no longer alive. Um, her, no one had, she'd never returned to her home. Um, she never went back to pick up clothes, clothing. She never cashed checks. She didn't access her bank account other than somebody used her debit card um, a couple days after she was last heard from. Mm -hmm. um, they, they went to Walmart and the dollar store. Um, but as it turned out, that wasn't Carrie. But she, she just would not have abandoned her child. She was a devoted mother. Um, her son was everything to her. And her family knew that. Um, but it took, it took this great team coming in. It was um, Avis and Doty, and then a genius um, special deputy, Anthony Cava, who was um, a, a digital expert who was able to trace eventually when they, enough information came, was able to trace these emails back to Liz. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about deputy Kava. Uh, he spent thousands of hours on his own time to. Yeah, they all did. They all put extra hours in and they could not have crapped the case. They could not have solved it if they didn't put in 
their own time. Yeah. And De- Deputy Kava, in your book, you state that he had to construct he had to construct a separate computer with a like a new program to handle these twenty thousand plus texts and emails to 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 go through all the metadata and everything and the photographs and everything when when they had access to Liz and Dave's and I believe Amy's phone too, right? They all volunteered uh, their phones to be to be examined, and Liz didn't realize that even though you have something deleted from your phone, it's never really truly gone. <laughs> Unfortunately for her. Yeah. I, I got to tell my, uh, I have a teenage daughter and uh, two boys too. And so I'm always like, don't, you know, you got to be careful about the internet. You got to be careful about this kind of thing because you think you hit delete or you throw it in the trash can on your computer desktop. Yeah. It's not gone. It's there, you know, mm-hmm. it's there forever. Not that they're criminal stalkers or anything like that, but yeah, I'm just like, you know, you got to be careful out there with the, with this with this stuff. But yeah, Deputy Kama was able to get into this information and he was able to pull and mine all this, this data uh, from Liz's phone. And, and he discovered that she was using these, these, uh, these apps to disguise where the texts were coming from. And she scheduled them way in advance to go when she knew she was going to be with Dave. And then Dave and her get texts at pretty much the same time. And he's like, Dave's like, well, it can't be Liz. Because she's getting texts too, and I'm right there. Her phone's blowing up right next to me. She's sitting right there, and her phone's on the table, the coffee table, and it's blowing up right there. So he had like what you were saying, uh, writing about a confirmation or um, confirmatory bias uh, about all this thing, all these things happening with Liz. Like he, um, you know, the, the tendency to, you know, kind of interpret or you know recall information that kind of confirms or supports one's beliefs that, you know, Carrie was doing all this. Carrie couldn't have been anything else because it was Carrie, Carrie, Carrie. And so you just kind of, kind of had that mentality that all this is happening to us. And they were bonding over that they had this in common, that this ex of Dave's was harassing them. It drew them closer together in some twisted way. Yes. uh, Dave had tremendous guilt because he believed that Liz was being stalked and he felt protective of her. Of course, she loved that. And he felt so guilty that he had ruined her life by bringing the stalker in that um, he spent more time with her than he otherwise would have. And they ended up getting back together. Unbelievable. So we've got the two main detectives, Avis and Dodie. Uh, they're also, when, when they kind of find out or when they're kind of discovering that this crime happened in Douglas County, Omaha, they're Potawatomi, Council Bluffs, Iowa. So they had mm-hmm. to bring in the Omaha detectives. And so they brought in a detective Schneider. Uh, yep. Dave, detective Dave Schneider is a cold case detective. And he was, he was on board right away. He was really impressed with, with what Avis and Doty had done. And he agreed with them. Um, he agreed with their theory. And he started to help them with that. Yeah, I want to go back to Avis and Doty just real quick because it, you you touched on it, but those two guys they had that unique perspective of like let's let's investigate her. One guy investigates, let's try and find out if she's alive, or let's investigate this that she's alive doing all this. And the other one investigated, researched from the perspective that she was deceased, which I thought was uh, pretty. I don't want to say innovative, but it was it was such a different way to like outside of the box kind of uh, investigative mm-hmm. technique. And so they were able to, you know, start putting this evidence together and it started pointing toward Liz. Everything was pointing toward Liz. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought it was remarkable. The story about um, Carrie's car, uh, the, the vehicle that she had, how after she disappeared, you know, it, it was sold, went from one owner to another, and they were still able to track it down and do these DNA blood tests. And they determined that she was in fact killed in her own vehicle. Mm-hmm. Yes, they'd actually um, checked the, the car pretty thoroughly, at least twice before they discovered the blood. Um, they had no reason to believe that the murder had occurred in the car until they tricked Liz into um, impersonating Amy Flora. Um, Liz thought she could... Um, she could trick police into believing that Amy had killed Carrie. And the the detectives set Liz up. 
um, and they let her think that they believed her. Brilliantly. Yes, brilliantly. And they, they knew that these emails were actually coming from Liz, but they played along. And so Liz wrote emails pretending to be Amy Flora and confessed to some things, including the fact that uh, Carrie had been stabbed in her vehicle. And when the detective saw that, um, they knew there was truth in these emails, even though they knew Amy wasn't sending them. Mm -hmm. They knew that Liz was giving them information, some of some what would be true. So um, they knew that then that they had to go take another look at the car. And so they uh, took out the front seats and they peeled back the, the covers and found that the passenger seat was drenched with what looked like blood. And they had that tested. It took a few weeks, but it was indeed um, Carrie's blood. So this, this story is, uh, now, I, I'm sorry, I, I, it's so convoluted. So Carrie was, they think, was killed, or they could prove that there, she lost a lot of blood in the car. So obviously she was killed in Douglas County in Omaha in the car. And then Liz took the car and transported the body, they believe, someplace where it was uh, disposed of by fire. They suspect that. They did have some images um, that they later found on Liz's phone, images Liz thought she had deleted that showed tarps over something about the size of a body um, and that appeared to be burned. And that's what led them to believe that. And that's almost like serial killer um, MO where they take like, um, there, there's a, a couple instances of like these trophies or, yeah, you know, like, like uh, there was photos and, so they, man, this is so crazy. I'm sorry. So uh, they are going through all this metadata. They're finding pictures that she thought was deleted on on some card over here, over there. And they're kind of piecing all this together. They they find this lots of blood that she had surface cleaned the seat, the upholstery, so the inspectors um, uh, didn't see it right away. They didn't see it because they thought it was a missing person case. They weren't looking for a crime scene. So that's why they didn't find it right away. So they peel back, like you said, the fabric. They find that the upholstery, not the upholstery, but the cushion of the of the, of the seat was just drenched, saturated with blood. They test it with uh, some DNA samples from hairbrushes that Carrie's mom had. They find out that it's Carrie's blood. One in, what is it, two trillion, per, you know, yeah. it has to be Carrie. So so they know she's she's lost a lot of blood in this car. They know she's dead. So they keep looking for more for more information. They look for more evidence because it's a pretty circumstantial case. There's no body. There's no murder weapon. Um, no, no witnesses, nothing like that. You know, they, they don't mm -hmm. have like a traditional crime scene. They don't have any of that kind of stuff or, or, or even about, you know, the body, they can't find the body. So they, they're, they're piecing all this information together and they ask Dave, the investigators, is there anything else that we haven't found. Is there anything that you can think of? And Dave's like, oh, I, I think there's this old tablet in storage. And they they take this old tablet, they pop the card out of it, Detective Cava examines it, and lo and behold, there's a photograph of a tattoo that everybody says that's Carrie's tattoo on her foot. And the photo was taken post-mortem. Yes. And it's it's absolutely horrific. Um, but also a miracle. It is miraculous. That without that, I don't know if um, if Liz would have been found guilty. Right. She might have been, but it was that piece of evidence that was the most powerful. There's all this circumstantial evidence too, like I was saying. Like, and when I was getting to, I didn't finish my thought about the uh, serial killers' uh, use of uh, or them saving trophies of their victims. Mm -hmm. There was, when you mentioned that she went to, Liz went to Walmart in the dollar store, at some point she bought a shower curtain and the shower curtain was just a cheap shower curtain, you know, just a Walmart brand or a dollar store brand shower curtain, nothing really spectacular about it or really extravagant about it. But whenever she moved to all these different places and she moved a lot, uh, she was always, you know, never paying her bills and she was kind of moving from place to place, she always took this one shower curtain uh, with her, which I thought was pretty damning. 
but on its own, it's it's not really a piece of evidence. It's just another it's another link to this crazy chain of of of, of evidence against her uh, for this crime. Well, the fact that um, the fact that the a shower curtain identical to the one in Liz's bathroom was purchased with by, with Carrie's debit card. Right. A couple of days after Carrie died, is that they know it's the same shower curtain, and they also know that it was purchased. It was new. It was purchased about the same time um, as the one that was bought from Walmart with the debit card, because they could see in these these photos that that Liz took. She took selfies of herself naked in front of it. Um, there were creases in the shower curtain still where they could see it was folded up. Mm -hmm. So they knew the timing was also right. But like you say, it's, there's so many of those curtains that were sold. It was not, um, it was not the smoking gun, but it was an interesting piece of evidence. So when you're doing these interviews for your book, and you're meeting all the major players. Uh, did you know much? Did you get to sit down with James Martin Davis, the defense attorney for Liz? Yes, I did. Yeah, we went to lunch at the Omaha Press Club. Oh, he was great. He's a fascinating guy. Oh yeah, he's, he's got a lot of good stories. Local, local legend, James Martin Davis. Um, for those, we have listeners all over the country, and in fact, around the world. James Martin Davis, he is like the Omaha version of somebody on the OJ Simpson dream team. And I don't mean that as mm -hmm. a pejorative. I don't mean that as a pejorative. I mean that like he's always on the news. He represents a lot of media people here in town. So um, there's a radio uh, duo here in town, these shock jocks called Todd and Tyler. And he's on their show pretty often because he's their attorney when they go to do contract negotiations and stuff. And he, James Martin Davis was in the secret service. He fought in Vietnam. I, went to a, a talk by James Martin Davis when I was in high school, he lost his son in a car accident when his son was yeah. 16. And yes. so I always had a soft spot in my heart for James Martin Davis, no matter who he defended, because when he came and spoke to our youth group, his son hit a patch of, of black ice and just crashed his car. Young, inexperienced driver, no, no alcohol, nothing like that. And he, it was just a solo, horrible accident. But James Martin Davis came to our youth group and just talked to us kids just as a hurt dad, just saying, be careful wow. and life is precious. And, and, and I just always had a soft spot in my heart for this James Martin Davis uh, attorney. He's, uh, he's, he's, he's an Omaha legend for sure. So uh, that's nice that you had yeah. a, a good lunch with him at the Omaha Press Club. I, I did. I really enjoyed his company. He had so many good stories. I could write a whole book about him. Yeah, somebody should. <laughs> yeah, they should. Well, he's actually a writer himself, and he writes very well. So, yes. who knows? Maybe he'll do it. Right, right. So, so Liz gets the help of James Martin Davis, uh, this Omaha legendary defense attorney, and she stiffs him on the bill too. Which <laughs> was, I was like, of course, of uh, course she did, because that was yeah. when I when I was re remembering that James Martin Davis defended her. I was like, well, how did she, how did she swing that? I mean, she didn't have any money. I mean, how'd she pay James Martin Davis? Because he's, he's Tom Dollar in town, you know, and, and yeah. I'm sure he'll take cases that will get him in the press and get him in front of a TV camera. He's that way. Super funny that way. But I was like, how, how did she afford him? Well, she didn't. She conned James Martin Davis too. So. Yes, she did. And she showed him, um, what she said was her tax return. She had a cleaning business mm -hmm. and she showed him, um, apparently forged documents that indicated she was going to be getting a large check back. <laughs> and he believed her and he laughed, you know, when he, when he told me about it, he laughed about it. He, he was laughing at himself. Sure. But she was very, very good at conning people. She conned a lot of people and a lot of very intelligent people too. Like Dave Krupa is actually a very intelligent guy. Um, and most of the people that she fooled were intelligent um, she had a harder time fooling females though. And that was something my mom always said was that when it comes to sociopaths, males are better at fooling the females and the females are better at fooling males. I think it's because they use their sexuality. Interesting. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure there's a little bit of uh 
oh, poor me, and maybe a little bit of flirtation or something like that uh, to kind of get her get her way. Yeah, and, and the, the um, female sociopath knows that if she appears vulnerable, she's going to get more from people, mm. from men. And so they, they, they know how to cry on cue. They're really good actresses. Oh, and in your book, I felt so bad for, it's a pseudonym, but for, for the young man, uh, Garrett Sloan in your yeah. book. Now, Garrett was a guy, met Liz and kind of, kind of fell for her, but she really uh, took him for a turn too. I mean, she ended up getting everything paid for by this guy. Um, she lived there, Scott, you know, uh, rent free in his yeah. home, in his basement. Um, just, I just felt so bad for him. Like she kept conning all these men all the way through this whole sorted deep, uh, this whole sorted story that she just kept getting her way all the time with these men. She did, but she's not anymore. No. Did you ever have the chance to talk to her or did you reach out to her at all? I did. I reached out to her early on and told her I was writing the book. And I I didn't I didn't pretend to be on her side. I was just very polite and asked if she had anything she wanted to say. Mm-hmm. And she wrote back an extremely polite letter uh, saying that she was trying to prove her innocence so she could get out of there and it wouldn't be good for her to have a book out there right now. Uh. Um, but she changed her mind. And she wrote me a six-page letter uh, after the book had already gone to press. And we're doing an update on the um, the paperbacks. It's coming out in about a month. And so I have um, I talk a little bit about what was in that letter. Oh, wow. In the update of the book. But she's, she still claims that she's innocent. Right. So she goes to trial. Uh, oh, I didn't even mention... Things got really hairy and Dave had a gun. It was stolen. Liz ends up getting shot by, she shot herself, but, but she shoots herself in the leg. She says it's Amy that's shooting her. I mean, she really, I hate to say she spiraled out of control because she had been just circling the drain for years out of control, but she, the, the investigators really thought, oh my gosh, we got it. We have to do something now because she's shooting herself in the leg at Big Lake Park. Beautiful park, by the way. Um, she shoots herself in the leg. She's she's throwing rocks through windows. She set her home on fire. Uh, I mean, they really thought things could be fatal for Amy and Dave. Yes. And they did have the tracker on her car. And they were monitoring that. So mm-hmm. if she went anywhere near Amy's apartment, um, they were ready. And they must have had a detail on her 24 seven. Yeah. Um, if, if she were to pause in Amy's parking lot, they were ready to go there. But what she did was she drive through loop through the apartment and leave. And she did that several times a day. But it made them nervous. They they uh, didn't want anything to happen to Amy, but they couldn't arrest Liz too soon because we have a right to a speedy trial. And if you arrest a suspect before you have enough evidence, there's a very good chance that they could get off. And once they're once they're found not guilty, they can't be tried again for the same crime for the same murder. Yeah, double jeopardy, sure. And J- and James and James Martin Davis. He wanted, he didn't want them to find a body. So yeah, he was all for them going to trial. Yes. And the, um, the prosecution was stunned uh, when they saw that they had just three months to prepare, um, but they managed to do it and the detectives helped them. They were so, the detectives were so organized and they had their, um, their evidence in order and um, Detective Ryan Avis was asked to sit with the prosecution um, throughout the trial and he was able to pull up anything they wanted instantly. He knew right where it was. Yeah. She goes to trial in December. She's arrested in December, right before Christmas of 2016. The, the, the murder happened in November of 2012. So four years of this terror is going on in their lives. She's finally arrested December 22nd. And then in May 2017, 
she's found uh, guilty in a judge trial. Mm-hmm. It was a long time coming. It was a long time coming, but justice prevailed. Yes. And, and Dave was never bothered. You know, starting the day she was arrested, he was never bothered again uh, with a text message or a, or a, a, a email, and nothing like no. that. So unfortunately he has guilt. He blames himself. It wasn't his fault, but the fact that Liz murdered Carrie because she was obsessed obsessed with Dave makes him feel terrible. Sure. He didn't have any way of knowing he didn't do anything wrong. And honest to God, the way you write your book, you do such a great job of setting the record straight about Carrie because she had been maligned for years by Liz. I mean, if you talked about Carrie Farver before the arrest of Liz, you thought she was crazy, a stalker, um, a fugitive hiding from her family, hiding from the authorities. Who knows where she's at? You know, they're looking in homeless shelters for the Sienna Francis house. They're looking all over for her. Um, so you did a great job of thank you of setting the record straight and letting the world know that she was this kind, brilliant, beautiful, thoughtful, caring person who never would have done any of these things. She never would have right. she never would have abandoned her family. She never would have not been there for her father when he, when he was dying of cancer. She never would have done those things. That wasn't no. her. That wasn't her. And it was it was bad enough that Liz murdered her. But then she dragged her reputation through the mud. Oh, it's like she killed her twice. And she tormented Carrie's family, her friends and family for years. Oh, yeah. The the stories about... Now, I've volunteered and helped out at the Santa Francis house uh, for 20 years. I've been helping out doing things there. And so I, I, you know, I know the people that work there and I know the the people that they serve. And the the parts of the book where you talk about Carrie sending messages to her mom saying, mom, come pick me up. I'm at the homeless shelter. And then you describe the long drive, the 30 minute drive from where Carrie's mom is driving into Omaha, going to the homeless shelter. And then she's not there. She never was there. Nobody's ever seen her. It was just all a lie. Unbelievable. No. And actually, um, in addition to the, the written message, Nancy also got a phone call and it was from a man and it was not David Krupa. But yeah. he said he was, and he said, um, Carrie asked me to call you and, and ask you to go pick her up at the homeless shelter. Um, I suspect that phone call was from Liz and that she was using a voice deepening app, mm-hmm. which is really creepy. And we all have to be careful about who we talk to on the phone when we're talking to strangers, because you may think you're talking to a female and it could actually be a male. So Leslie, when you're, when you're writing this book and you're researching this book and you're traveling to and from Omaha and, and you're kind of compiling all this information, what, what kind of emotions did you go through? Did, you know what I mean? I can't imagine what it was yeah. like to, to read all this and, 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 and read about and, and the, the heartache from the family and Dave's guilt and everything else. What was it like for you to put all this together and present this book to the public? Well, the first thing is I had to understand it. And I ordered the transcripts, which are expensive, but I ordered them. Mm-hmm. They're almost 3,000 pages. And I had to read through them twice before I really had a grasp on it. But it wasn't until I actually went to Omaha and sat down with people that I really understood. Because not everything came out in the trial. Um, for instance, the fact that Dodie and Avis set Liz up and tricked her into sending those confession emails. Um, and they explained that to me. Um, so I, I did feel for everybody um, more than anything. I think I came away feeling really good about people and the fact that these detectives work so hard to get justice for Carrie and that they cared so much about Carrie's family and they care so much about Carrie that they've actually set up a scholarship fund for her. They did this themselves. And they want Carrie to be remembered for something other than murder. And so it was a positive thing. Mm-hmm. And so I think um, as sad as it was and as heartbreaking as it was to, you know, to hear Nancy's story, um, 
it was also very uplifting because it restored my faith in the goodness of people. Because most of the people involved in this case were really good people. Have you had much contact uh, with um, with uh, either like Nancy or Dave uh, since the yes, book? Yes, we is- keep it. We all keep in touch. Oh, we do. Oh, that's good. That's good. Yeah, I'll probably know everybody forever. Well, it's an incredible book. I I still thank you. I just. <laughs> It's such a weird, crazy story. I mean, I was reading things and I'm like, wait, what did I just read? I, I, I don't, you know, I'm reading this book and, and you wrote it. So, I mean, I don't even know how you kept everything straight for a while because it is, there's so many twists and turns in this book. And we've, we've been talking, oh my goodness, what is it? It's been almost an hour we've been talking and we've covered, you know, 10% of your book, 5% of your book. So if people are out there thinking that they know the story of what's going on, Dear listeners, you need to check out this book, A Tangled Web, by by my guest Leslie Rule. Leslie, I I you talked about you write uh, other books too, or you've written other books too, and this was your first kind of venture into true crime, like your mom. But um, I, I have a keen interest in the paranormal, and I know you've written a bunch of ghost books too. Yes, I've got four nonfiction books of ghost stories, and I also have a book on angel encounters. So um, that was a lot of fun doing that kind of research. And I found that almost everybody I talk to, well, I would say about one in three people who I meet and I ask if they've ever had a ghostly encounter, Mm -hmm. um, about one in three admit that they have. So it's very, very common, but most people won't talk about it uh, freely because they don't want to be marked as crazy. Sure. When I wrote the ghost book, I chose stories where people were willing to let me use their real names because I think the stories seem more real to people when there is an actual person willing to stand behind it and say, yes, this happened to me. I would love to have you on again uh, and sometime when we have more time and to talk about uh, these, these ghost stories. I'm glad you said they were uh, nonfiction. Did you say nonfiction? Is that what you said? Nonfiction. They're all true. Good. Because I'm glad somebody said ghost stories and nonfiction in the same sentence, in the same breath. <laughs> well, I grew up in a haunted house and I always thought it was normal. I thought everybody lived in the haunted house. Yeah, right. And I was really surprised when I discovered that there were people who didn't believe in ghosts. That was a, a weird concept for me. That's crazy to me. <laughs> it's crazy to you that they don't believe when they don't believe it. Yes. yes yeah. Yes. See, me too. And I, you know, my parents believed in it and that, you know, we all lived in a haunted house and stuff happened and I never questioned whether it was real or not. All right. I got to ask haunted house. What, what kind of experience did you have growing up? It was an old house on a windy cliff overlooking Puget Sound. And it was actually the house my dad grew up in. And it was so close to the water that on stormy days, the waves would hit our windows. And we had a sobbing ghost that I heard there once, who was actually heard throughout the whole neighborhood. And it was most often uh, on 6th Avenue up the street. There was a family that um, rented a house there. And each night, as it started to get dark outside, they would hear what sounded like a faint crying and it sounded like it was coming from the field behind their house. And the later and the darker it got, the louder the crying got until it sounded as if it was coming from their cellar. And it was accompanied by the sounds of jars rolling and bones crunching. So the lady's name was Sandy and she was a friend of my mom's. And she came down one day and asked my mom, Um, Would you check out the cellar with me? Um, It was not like a a big basement where, you know, rec room with pool table and that kind of thing. It was just an empty space that nobody used, you know, shallow room. And so my mom said, yeah, I'll go go look. Maybe we can figure out what's making that noise. Or maybe there's an animal down there. So they prepared to go in and they tried to get the dog to go in. But the dog refused. And it stood there and it's the fur on the back of its neck rose and the dog wouldn't go in. Um, so my mom and Sandy went in and they found a perfectly swept floor. 
no signs of any jars or bones or an animal. Mm. But it, it, I heard it just the one time and it was the most heartbreaking sobbing. Oh. And it really pulled on my heartstrings because it sounded like someone's, someone uh, was absolutely devastated. It sounded like their heart was breaking. How sad. Oh my gosh. Wow. Well, we'll have to have you on again. And I would love to talk and pick your brain about your paranormal experiences and, and the wonderful books that you've written about that subject too. I have had such a great time, just a fascinating time listening and talking to Leslie Rule, bestselling author. She has written the book, oh man, A Tangled Web, A Cyber Stalker, A Deadly Obsession, and The Twisting Path to Justice. I always tell the other guests that are on my show, I've had some people on that have that have like paranormal TV shows on the different networks and everything. And I'm like, you guys ought to come to Omaha, Nebraska, because things are creepy here. And (laughs) you actually came to Omaha and found something very creepy, but very, very true. And I thank you so much for spending time with me this evening and, and discussing your fantastic book. Well, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Everybody, Leslie Rule was my guest, and I want to thank you all for listening to this episode of the Necronomicast. There we go, ladies and gentlemen, episode 197 of the Necronomicast featuring true crime bestselling author Leslie Rule. I can't believe that happened here in Omaha. You know, we always pride ourselves on being Nebraska nice and kind, courteous Midwesterners, and every once in a while, You get a nut here in the Midwest. It happens. It's true. And I want to thank Leslie for being such a great guest. One of the great things about having a show like this is when you contact these people and you get to know them off the microphone, she was so courteous and so polite and so nice and just had a wealth of information and eager to share and makes everything I do for you on this show so worthwhile. Coming up next on the Necronomicast, episode 198 will feature author and television personality, historian, Troy Taylor. He's written over 130 books, and one of his latest books was all about the weird, strange curses that plague musicians, all the way from classical music and Gregorian chant days all the way up to modern day era. I'm talking about... The 27 Club, people dying in their 20s. We're talking about plane crashes, weird curses that plague the music industry. So until then, I hope you have a wonderful couple weeks till that episode comes out. The sun's coming up over the horizon, so it's time to get some sleep. And as always, this episode is copyright 2021, all rights reserved. Take care, everybody.